Kentucky. Key facts. Abbreviation KY. Nickname the Bluegrass State. Capital Frankfurt. Flower Golden Road. Tree Tulip Poplar. Bird Cardinal. Instrument Appalachian Dulcimer. Motto United we stand, divided we fall. The Commonwealth of Kentucky, the last of the four commonwealths we will shall meet on our travels, seems to be bordered by more states than any other. You might say the Kentucky spirit is part Missouri, part Illinois, part Indiana, part Ohio, part West Virginia, and part Virginia, and part Tennessee. In other words, as much Midwest as Southern. Of course, the Kentucky spirit is really bourbon whiskey, and I'm on my, on my way to find some. Mind you, the state split personality does seem crucial to understanding Kentucky. You might look at the Civil War as a dispute between the two opposing sides of her identity. Kentucky born Abraham Lincoln, President of the Union, versus Kentucky born Jefferson Davis president of the Confederacy. When I ask a Kentuckian if Kentucky is the South, they reply, somewhat nomically, Kentucky is a Southern state, but we are not in the South. Hmm. Woodford Reserve. First time I must go to West Sile, which as everyone knows is just outside Paris, only this West Sile is pronounced Versailles and lies about 30 miles west of Paris, Kentucky, the county seat of Bourbon County. Hidden off Route 60, behind white trail fences, and tucked low down in a valley beneath the green rolling fields of prime Kentucky post country, I finally discovered a charming grey stone building that reminds me instantly of the many Scottish whiskey distillers I have happily visited in the past. This is Woodford Reserve, the place where a sour mash fermentation was invented by one Dr. James Crow back in the 1820s. Chris Morris, the President Day Master Distiller, shows me around. Everything here is done the old-fashioned way. The traditional copper steels were custom-built in Glasgow, the barrels are coppered, charred, for color and flavor, labeled, filled, and bunged by hand. Bourbon differs from scotch in that it must by law be made mostly from maize, corn as they call it here, with barley, rye, and wheat making up the rest if desired. Sour mash refers to a fermentation process in which the pH value of the yeast enzymes is regulated by the addition of acid, as in the making of sourdough bread, something like that anyway, to be honest, by the time I have inhaled all those fumes when the vats drilled some whip house, sucked in my portion of the angel's share in the cellar, and tasted the liquor in its various stages of aging, Nothing much sinks in. I look down at the bubbles coming up from the vat. That's carbon dioxide, Chris, Chris explains. CO2? Not very environmentally friendly of you. Chris laughs, moderately. A cat wanders past. Do you think that cat might be alcoholic? I ask. All oh, those fumes. He's an employee. One of our mousers, so he better not be drinking. I laugh immoderately. The fumes are definitely getting to me. Time, says Chris, to do some tasting. He makes it sound as if terrible chore awaits us. I add brunch to my first class. I have heard this called for in bars up and down America, in my bourbon and branch. Brunch actually just means plain water, but in one's meant water from a branch or tributary stream of a river, a tiny mouth just takes the potter's pick of fire from the drink. While I rapidly neck three glasses of the 1995, Chris talks about the spectrum of flavors 
apricot, cinnamon, berried coffee, vanilla, and dusty oak. You see, raspberry juice is just raspberry juice. But the action of yeast in bourbon creates over 200 separate flavor elements. Nobody really understands me. So the number of the actual flavor combination possible is 200 times 199 times 998 and so on. Billions, many of them beyond human sensory reach, of course. My mommy understands me. My teddy bear understands me. Chris offers me a handkerchief, the uncontrollable souls turned into controllable giggles, and I'm led away, hiccuping. Woodford Reserve is proud to be the official bourbon of the Kentucky Derby, America's most prestigious, glamorous, and celebrated horse race. In fact, Lexington, where I'm taking my drunken self to bed, is the capital of America's racing industry. In many ways, it can be regarded as the racing capital of the world. If my hangover doesn't prevent me, I shall find out more tomorrow. Branding You have to admire the branding people. You know those advertising PR professionals who are paid fortunes to come up with slogans and logos for corporations, consoles and other institutions. Kentucky is best known for bourbon whiskey and for horses. I think you'll agree with me that for once the design and branding people earned their money. This is what they came up with. Kentucky. Unbridled spirit. You've got to hand it to them. Genius just two words, but they say it all. Pretty Run and Kinland. Nurse in a gently nagging head. I head out for Pretty Run, a very well-named brood mare farm owned and prettily run by Tom and One Mater in the heart of bluegrass country. I pick that bone with him straight away. The grass is green, green as anything. From a distance in the spring, says Tom in a hot melting Kentucky drawl. The blue seed heads of the poor grass give a kind of azure tinge to the fields. I take his word for it, but cannot help feeling let down. I was so looking forward to seeing genuinely blue grass. I've noticed the name Van Meter just about everywhere in the Lexington area, and it turns out he's one of a family that have lived and worked here for eight or nine generations. I watch spirited mares, all of them pregnant, frisking and skittering about the fields, tossing their manes, shivering their flanks, and acting as thoroughbreds wheel, leaping and eye-rolling panic at the sight of just about anything, in other words, especially Stevens. I can spook a dead donkey. I don't know what it is that our fourth-hoofed friends see in me, but whatever it is, they don't like it. Tom buys mares, pays stud farms to allow him to bring them to be covered by a stallion, and then finds himself to be, as nature takes her due course, the proud owner of a brand new thoroughbred foal, which he will sell as a windling, if all that has just stopped suckling. Mostly he does this on behalf of owners. The skill is to understand dams and sires, bloodlines and form, which is to say the pedigrees and recent histories of the parent, mare and stallion, well enough to create a foal that will grow into a winning racehorse, resolved with a lot of money are prepared to pay huge sums for the most glamorous and dazzling bloodlines. They sold the mare at a local sale last week for $10 million, Tom tells me. Ten million? The Dubai and the Irish, they pay big money. See me, I take more pride in buying a mare for 20,000 that gives birth to a fall worth 100,000 than I would in, in buying a mare for 1 million. That mother's a fall worth two, one is fivefold increased, the other only twofold. When I come see me try and sell some of my horses, the local sale turns out to be Kinland's November breeding stock sale, the largest thoroughbred wholesale in the world. Tom has a couple of mares selling there today, so we drive over to take a look. 
British racing has tetra cells, so the elegant sales ring in New Market, Suffolk, and America has Kingland, Kentucky, equally elegant but on a much, much grander scale. I'm all for racing, it's pretty. People dress up and enjoy themselves. Yes, there is gambling, but it somehow seems a great deal less squalid than at the Trump Taj Mahal. Mind you, everything on the planet is less squalid than the Trump Taj Mahal. Racing is also a sporting passion. The jockeys and horses seem happy enough and money is generated for local and national economies. However, wrong of me, no doubt, but none of the bloodstock acquiring business that takes place today interests me anything like as much as the sound of the auctioneers make. I'm sure a true scholar of the turf would have found much more to excite his or her curiosity in the sales ring of Kingland, but call me shallow, call me silly, for me it was all about the hypnotic, thrilling, hilarious, impressive and jaw-droppingly skillful auction chanting. Impossible to reproduce satisfactorily on the American auctioneering is all about filler words, as Justin Holberg, one of the Kinland auctioneers, was kind enough to tell me. You go to auctioneer school and learn the basic art of spotting bidders and talking to lots and so on, but you also learn to develop your own chanting style. As I understand it, you state the amount that has been, been bid and the amount you would like to hear bid next, and in between those two sounds you place your filler words or phrases, bid me up, will you give me, bid it up now, sounds simple enough, but the auctioneer's song never ends, he's talking all the time in a percussively training drone that is not unlike that of Native American songs blended with bluegrass banjo plucking. 20,000 bid it up now, 30, 20, bid it up now, 30, 30, bid it up now, 40, 40, bid it up now, bid it up now, 50, 50, 40, bid it up now, 50, 50, bid it up now, 60, and so on. I leave Kentucky after meeting a member of the 10th generation 1 meter, Tom's son Grief, a charming group of a youth whose roughish playboy manner revealed hidden depths in his love of Kentucky and his desire to redevelop and invigorate Lexington's dilapidated downtown area. He revealed something else hidden, too, a tattoo of Kentucky on his buttock. Statal love can be no greater. What is so great about Kentucky, though, I wanted to know. She is everything America should be. She is a rural farming paradise, but she has a great city in Louisville. She may be landlocked, but these 1,200 miles of shoreline on one lake alone. She is mixed in race, but she is tolerant and neighborly, neither right wing nor no left wing, neither Yankee nor Dixie, neither Midwest nor Eastern. Kentucky are light, charming and friendly, but without overdoing that southern graciousness thing. Kentucky, greatest state in the Union. All that and unbridled spirit too.